Uh, Jay Hagadich, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, for tuning back in. Um, Jay Hodges, I'm a proud Shin, uh, friend of Sinn Féin's, um, and I want to just uh, welcome you into a very brief discussion. There's been a lot of, of um, movement and, and things and changing very rapidly uh, in the North, and, and uh, we want to actually bring in Karen Quinn, who is the Sinn Féin representative to North America, to kind of help us understand better and to uh, kind of give an explanation of what's been going on and, and really what that means and where that goes. So without further ado, I want to welcome Karen. Karen, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Jay. It's been pretty busy and pretty uh, intense, but things are doing well. The sun's shining here, so that's a, always a good thing in Ireland. Well, that's, that's good. And I, I can't thank you enough for taking a couple of minutes to sit down with us. Um, this is a complicated matter. Um, and so I just want to dive right into it. Very briefly, can you, let's start, let's start with explaining some of the players. Can you explain who the DUP is uh, and then who Arlene Foster is and kind of give us that background to like kick off this thing? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great way to start, Jay, because it's understanding that, that, as you say, the players. Now. So the, the DUP, or the Democratic Unionist Party, are the uh, largest unionist party in the North. So they're pro-British. And they are jointly lead the government in the North with Sinn Féin, with Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin. So, and it's meant to be a partnership arrangement, and they're meant to be joint, and they're meant to be working equally together. So previous to, I'll say in May, they were led by a woman called Arlene Foster. She'd been the leader of the DUP, I think, for about five years. And she was also the first minister. So she was basically the co-leader of the government in the North. There was a push against her, and it was led by a guy called Edwin Poots. Edwin Poots was the Minister for Agriculture, and the campaign was to unseat and replace Arlene Foster as the leader. This happened within like a, a five hour period, eight hour period, 12 hours tops. So one day Arlene Foster was the joint leader of government with Michelle O'Neill and Sinn Féin. And then the next, she had been deposed as the leader of the DUP and had to resign. And she stayed in office, and I'll come back to why that's important. She stayed in office with Michelle O'Neill while the DUP elected a new leader of their party. And again, that election seemed to have been very fraught and brutal. And the outworking of it was Edwin Poots became the leader of the DUP on the vote of one person. So the split was 1917. That one person had to switch sides. The guy who was competing against Edward Poots, a guy called Jeffrey Donaldson, who's an MP for the DUP, he would have became the leader. So you had a very split party in all of that. So Edwin Poots then becomes the leader of the DUP. And up until last Thursday, he was the leader of the DUP. He was in the he had that position for 21 days. And that's when things started to go a bit awry. One of the things that when Arlene Foster is the first, the joint first minister, in order to replace her. Just by the rules of Stormont, the DUP needed Sinn Féin support. And uh, Sinn Féin and Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou MacDonald had been in touch with the new DUP leadership and said, OK, well, before we move ahead on all this, you have to let us know are you going to honour the agreements that you had previously made. And so that, that became a discussion with the new DUP leadership. Uh, and that rolled on. So we've got, in terms of main players, you have the DUP as the lead party for unionism. You have Sinn Féin with them in the joint leadership of the government in the north. And you have a new leader in Edmund Poots. And waiting in the wings was a guy who he defeated, was a guy called Jeffrey Donaldson. Arlene Foster remains in place until uh, she resigns, which was last Monday. And in the rules of the assembly in the north, there's seven days to replace Arlene Foster, and that has to have the assent of Sinn Féin, of the Sinn Féin party. So that's the context for what happened, Jay. I don't know if that makes sense. So let me just ask you a couple of clarifying. This is an internal party matter for the DUP, and the only reason why Sinn Féin would be involved at all is because the 
Good Friday Agreement requires joint sharing of government. And so it, it's not um, it's not as if Sinn Féin was having to advise and consent on what the DUP was doing. It's that the power sharing agreement has set out a very distinct path as a way to govern. And so Sinn Féin was meeting that requirement to, to go forward as the DUP was dealing with an internal matter. Absolutely. So the discussion with the DUP wasn't about who led their party. The discussion between Sinn Féin and the DUP was, will you honour the agreements that were made? And it was an agreement made last January to re-establish the institutions and get them up and running. And part of that was to be an Irish Language Act. So uh, Mary Lee MacDonald in talking to uh, Edwin Poots and our negotiating teams had met and said, well, give us a timetable for when you're going to honour that commitment. The original agreement was that the legislation would be introduced within three months. So it should have been in place March or April of last year in order for it to get through in time. With COVID happening, that, that, couldn't, have, couldn't, have, that couldn't have proceeded at that time. So in December, January and February of this year, the DUP at various times had committed to introduce the legislation and had failed to do so. So it was put directly to Edwin Poots, can you give us a timetable? to have this Irish language act in place, and he refused. And it became very clear through those, those negotiations that he would not be bringing that legislation in in this term of the parliament and would not be honouring that part of the agreement to say it should be done within three months. So that automatically then flagged up a question for us is, we, how can you uh, support the nomination for somebody who's breaching their agreements and blocking the implementation of this agreement? So it came to a head, and again, the clock starts ticking when Arlene Foster resigns on the Monday, and you have seven days. So we had been in touch with the British government and the Irish government, who were both signatories to the agreement, and put it to them. And so what are you going to do with this? The DUP are refusing to implement a section of it. And Mary Lou MacDonald put it to the British government that they needed the act, and they needed to ensure that the legislation would be put in place. If it wasn't done in Stormont, then it would be done in Westminster. And this is where it gets, a bit, this is where it gets not to get too much into the weeds, but the British government in 2006 in St Andrews had agreed that they would, that they would bring forward an Irish language act at Westminster. So the DUP refused to do the, agree, the agreement from January of last year. That brings the British government into play because they had already previously agreed to bring forward an Irish language act. Uh, so I think by Wednesday of last week, or Wednesday night of last week, uh, the British government acknowledged that if the DUP blocked or refused to implement this piece of legislation, that they would introduce, they would introduce it and uh, make it law at Westminster in London. Again, that is what was agreed in the St Andrews Agreement, and it reflects what was agreed in the agreement of last year. So. That allowed Sinn Féin to say, well, we will go ahead then with the, the, we will go ahead with nominating the ministers and getting them in place. And everything seemed to be on track. Until uh, the following morning. And the first indication that the problem with the DUP was that uh, a letter was signed by their, their MP team calling for the process to be stopped. On the, basis that they are, on the basis that the British government were honouring their agreement. <laughs> so, which is all a bit strange. So just to clarify this, the, the DUP at this point, their, their members of parliament send a letter saying, we, we don't want to move forward with what we've agreed to move forward on because the British government is moving forward, has, has agreed to move forward on what it has already agreed to move forward on, and we don't like that. Is that... Yes. Okay. So, so how it plays out then on the Thursday morning, everything seemed to be in place. And watching from the outside, as we were, the assembly in the north meets, the uh, Edwin Poots comes into the chamber and nominates his guy as being for the first minister's role, a guy called Paul Given. And for the world, it looks like this is all going ahead and there, there wasn't a sense of crisis. Uh, Michelle O'Neill's nominated for Sinn Féin, both give acceptance speeches and, uh, uh, and sign up to the ministerial pledge of office. 
uh, and business goes on. Yeah. And then within about a half an hour, the news breaks that Edwin Poots had left, the DEP had been meeting upstairs. Edwin Poots had left that meeting, came downstairs and nominated Paul Given for this position against, while the meeting was still going on and while he left the meeting, the majority of members of the DUP uh, voted against the nomination. So you have a DUP leader against the majority of his party going ahead and making the nomination for the first minister's position. Uh, once that news broke, the DUP leadership, the DUP uh, summoned Edwin Poots to a meeting and basically within a couple of hours of that meeting, he had resigned, as I say, after 21 days in office as the leader of the DUP, he has resigned. Uh, and that's, they, they're now into a further round of uh, a leadership contest. But he, so yes, go ahead. I was going to say, Edwin doesn't, Edwin resigns his leadership position, but not his elected position. Yeah, so he's, he has, he has indicated he will resign his leadership position. He stays in position until the new leader is until elected. Yeah. And again, as you flagged up, basically the DUP have sacked their leader because the British government implemented, said they will implement an agreement which both the British government and the DUP signed up to. An agreement that was signed up to by Edwin Poots, Jeffrey Donaldson, and Arlene Foster, the, the three main players in this. Uh, and it, uh, as of today, it looks like Jeffrey Donaldson, who had been who had been beaten in the last leadership contest, is now the firm favourite to lead the DUP uh, going forward. So now this is. What I'm, what I'm getting is that this isn't actually a breakdown. There, there's confusion, I, I feel like, um, in some of, of, of the states um, about the fact that this isn't a breakdown between the DUP and Sinn Féin. This is an internal issue that the DUP is dealing with. Sinn Féin's only role in this is as it pertains to the power sharing government. Like that's like they're not participating in who can or who can't lead. Like that is an internal matter for the DUP to decide. But it sounds to me as if the DUP has got its own internal battles happening, and that's what they're that's what they are dealing with right now. Yeah, well, it, there's a couple of things that I feel like just came before the leadership contest, uh, or came before uh, Arlene Foster was uh, sacked from the DUP, and that was there was a, a run of very significantly bad polls, which showed a significant drop in support for the DUP. And that Sinn Féin was taking a lead. And I think one of them had Sinn Féin in lead by nine points, which means then I feel like Sinn Féin would be the leader in the joint office yeah. or the leader. Of it. And that throws up all sorts of problems just for unionism because they have always opposed power sharing. And the work as the first minister and deputy first minister would cause them a real problem. They also picked, and again, it wasn't a individual, the DUP as a party picked the wrong side on Brexit. They backed the Tories, they backed Boris Johnson, they backed the hardest possible Brexit. Boris Johnson then undermined their position and they have been sold short or sold out by the British government on the Brexit negotiations. And all of that has come on home to roost. So unionism doesn't like the way the Brexit issue has played out and they're blaming the DUP for that. Uh, and I suppose, Jay, the bigger context to all of this is the fact that unionism has now lost its majority for the last number of elections. So the assembly and the government that meets in the north, for the first time ever since the foundation of the state, no longer has an automatic unionist majority. Unionism is a, a minority position within that parliament. It's split three ways. And all of that is a fundamental fundamental challenge to how unionism's operated. Unionism's always operated as they were the majority, they would dictate the terms to everybody else. And they have always had a British government that they could rely on. Those three things, those two things are no longer in place. And so it's played out as an internal fight within the DUP. But the issue doesn't go away. I mean, if there's a commitment in Irish language, I've been there will be an Irish language. I've you know that the, the agreements that have been made need to be implemented because otherwise the wheels fall off politics completely 
as you know, as a trade union negotiator or trade union activist, once you strike a, an agreement, you have to work on the basis of that that's implemented. Yeah. So uh, what happens next? Like, what's the, what, give me kind of what the immediate next steps would be, and then also kind of more looking down the road at, at what will actually take place. Or do you even know? I mean, can you well, even well, actually make a guess? I, I, well, I can, we can see which way the process will work out. So I would look at the, the leadership of the DUP has to be resolved. And they have a process which would have that resolved within the next coming weeks, could be as short as this weekend. So they've reopened their leadership contest. Jeffrey Donaldson seems to be the front runner. It's interesting to see if anybody else will challenge him. If not, he will be appointed the leader quickly. Uh, Is there anybody else that could like legitimately I, challenge him? Not just challenge I, I, him, but have an actual like legitimate I, challenge. I, I, to be honest with you, at, by this stage, I've given up trying to analyze what's happening within the DUP. Ah, okay. and we'll just, <laughs> we just sit back and see what happens. And we will work with, as we have, we'll work with whoever is in the leadership of DUP. And that's been a, a constant. So while it was Ian Paisley, whether it was Peter Robson, or whether it was Arlene Foster, we have sought to work with them. But to work with people on the basis that they honor their agreements and are true to their word. Sure. That's the basic principle. So who they, whoever comes out on top of the... Uh, DUP leadership contest we will work with. And there is, not to get too much into the weeds again with all this, so uh, Paul Given is not, still technically the joint leader until he was the joint leader of the administration in the North and the government of the North until he resigns. The new leader of the DUP will have to reappoint and we go back into that process of mm. uh, the, the seven days after somebody resigns at the reappoint the positions. Um, and there's been all sorts of speculation about the DUP crashing, bringing down the institutions, the DUP continuing their protests. So that, that's a challenge that any leader of the DUP is going to have to make. Are they for power sharing and honouring their agreements? Are, are they on a collision and chaos uh, trajectory in terms of the North? I hope that makes it clear the past seven days, but it could, be, it could all have changed by the time this gets posted. <laughs> <laughs> I... Um, sure, it's it's clear as clear as Mississippi mud. Uh, that's it's, that's nice. Um, no, I, I I do appreciate your time on this, um, and I think it's an important thing for us to understand, um, e even you know as much as we need to. Um, but I, I just it is something that is going to impact uh, Ireland um, in the coming in the coming months, uh, but certainly in the future. Um, as we start to move more towards a united Ireland, these kinds of things are going to become more and more relevant uh, towards those things happening. So I, I'm very um, excited to, to be able to have you clarify some things, to have you talk with us. So thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, I will uh, I'll just wait and we'll have you back on uh, in a couple of weeks to, to pick up where we left off. Uh, it, could be a, it could be a matter of days we can be back on. And the worrying thing, I suppose, Jay, about all of this mess and the machinations that are going on within the DUP is how it plays out. Brexit is still there. It hasn't been resolved. You know, you have a British government who are going to mess about on issues like legacy. And there's a section of unionist political thought and who are working with paramilitary unionism and they're increasing the tension on the ground and they cannot be allowed to do that. I mean, it, Everybody should be united that peaceful and democratic means are the only way forward. There's no place for conflict on any side or by anyone in terms of resolving political issues. 100%. Uh, and basically, this comes down to how you run, how, what you expect in political life is what you should expect in private life. If you make an agreement, that, that agreement is honored and implemented. Jay, thanks for, thanks for giving us the opportunity to try and explain what has happened over the past number of weeks. I think you did a great job. Uh, I think you did a fantastic job. So I will thank you very much for that. Uh, and we will we will be looking to come back for more later. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, thanks to everybody for for uh, flipping us on and tuning us in. And uh, we will be back in touch with more information as it becomes available. Uh, thank you so much, Slon.